Chris Bryant got six, which I think yeah. was your question. So what ended up happening is the majority of players voiced to the union that they did not like that either, which is, I think, reasonable. And Dodds will disagree with me on that one. But <laughs> um, I think it's reasonable a reasonable concern when you see a guy like Chris Bryant get $6 million and then Jose Gray gets 64. And the way they have decided to reconcile that is the hard cap in, in uh, Latin America, which again is another thing that's disconcerting because We've never had a salary cap of any form ever, and it kind of potentially opens the door in the next labor talks. Like, well, if it works for this, maybe it'll work for this, and, and that's bad. That, that's why that's why I worry about it. Well, you could do what Lucius Fox did with uh, in Tampa Bay. You could go back to the Bahamas and live there. It's too bad I didn't know Chris Bryant then. I would have taken him. I would have taken him, him. I would take him to Mexico and put him put him up there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, my name is uh, Jerry Collender, uh, Lincoln University in uh, Boca Raton, Florida. Ooh. Uh, Hey, how you doing? <laughs> um, so a question for all three of you guys. Uh, you, you all mentioned, especially Joshua, that in 2020, 20, 2021, there might be a uh, massive uh, argument or disagreement with international players. So if you were Tony Clark, how, what changes would you make to, uh, to make sure that everything goes smoothly and there's no big difference? Since you guys have all the answers. Yeah, yeah right. We, 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 we have, have to play Tony Clark. You, you know, well, I don't want to play Tony Clark. No, <laughs> he's too tall, he's six foot seven. Okay, so what yeah. would you do? <laughs> well, I think, I think right now there's not much we can do. Yeah. You know, you've got to let the thing ride out. You're going to start seeing all the bitching and crapping and everything yeah. going on. And, and then once that starts, then you've got to start thinking, okay, what are we going to do? We better start early. We better be proactive before 2021 hits. Like Josh was saying, they're, they're trying to bring that, that difference between what an American kid gets and an international kid gets. Right now it's like this. You're trying to bring it like that. But what you don't want is for all of a sudden you start instituting salary caps. Right. Because what's made the, the union so strong is, you know what, if a guy, if, if Sylvia's worth millions and millions, give it to her. You know, don't come with a starting salary cap. That, or or the, other, the other big part of it is the guaranteed dollars. What's magnificent about baseball, why agents, why we love baseball, is that the, the contracts are guaranteed. So Tony's going to have to look, and his constituents are going to have to look how this plays out, yeah. how it rides out. It's, it's too early to tell. Yeah. Uh, uh, next question. Well, real, real, oh, real, go ahead, Josh. What was hard about that, though, when we got back early on, is that there was no agent input at all from yeah. what I saw. So okay. we didn't get the voice. Good Maybe. insight. Well, what happened was we're supposed to have meetings every November to discuss all this stuff. This thing yeah. just started, took off, and they canceled these meetings. First time ever. And the yeah. First time ever. But they, they had, the, and you understand, they had that deadline. They had to hit that deadline because if not, you know, public appearance perception would have been crazy. It would have gotten the deal. Well, and that's why we do this conference, give you guys a voice that you don't have. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I am John. Good morning, Matthew Schilling. I'm an attorney from the West Palm Beach, Florida area also. Ooh. And I have a two-tiered question. Uh, for Ms. Lynn, uh, like the transition from the practice of law into becoming a player agent, and I would be grateful for your thoughts and guidance in that, uh, in that respect. Um, and then um, also, um, Mr. Guznick, the West Palm Beach area has become more concentrated with minor league teams. They're building a magnificent complex. I live there. <laughs> and, and, and I'm wondering what opportunities or guidance that you might be able to Send my give gloves. Uh, Go get gloves. Just, 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 just get gloves. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Josh. Uh, yeah, um, like like so. I said, I'm uh, I'm training competition. Um, yeah, all right. Uh, uh, no, uh, we'll do that instead. Don't yeah, worry. <laughs> no, really. Um, just go to games. You gotta go to games, and it sounds stupid, but buy a ticket, go to a game, sit with scouts, ignore everyone else, and talk to them. Talk to all the scouts. Figure out what they know because. They, they are the ones that know what, in theory, what they're doing and how to break in because they already did it. And, you know, you really have to, you really have to love it. You have to be okay not making any money for a really long period of time. And then I, I don't mind giving this example. So today I'm probably going to lose $4 million because I used to represent Kenley Jansen. And that sucks. And everyone can say, you know, it's part of the job, you roll with it it still feels like I lost $4 million today. So you've got to be okay knowing you're going to lose that kind so of money. So somebody, if you see them, you know, buy them Starbucks. Or yeah, really. <laughs> so, but, but, I'm, but, but really, though, I'm okay with that because it's part of it. And if you don't know it's part of it going into it, you're not going to make it. And you can't just sit there like, oh, man, I had him, I had him. You're going to get fired by an all-star team before you make it. And... This is the best advice I ever got, was if you're not profitable as an agent after seven years, you need to quit. And 
and I I lived by that my whole career. Yeah. I, you know, the, the whole you know going back just you're making that transition. I did it from the accounting world into into baseball. I lucked into it, but but the main thing was. Find a scout, find somebody. I used to sit next to an older gentleman that he was in the million dollar arm. The, the guy was always falling asleep, Ray Pointman. <laughs> very, very good scout, talented evaluator. I used to sit with him in games in Denver, in Phoenix, when, and I just pound him with questions, pound him with questions. I could care less whoever I was there. Learn how to evaluate players and then get in with those scouts to see if they can open up doors for you. But you can't be shy about it. You just have to go for it. Just go for it. If they tell you, hey, kid, get the hell out of here, just keep going. Keep going. They're eventually going to let you in. And just find the next guy. Yeah, and the, the, the key is really, yeah, to establish relationships on the baseball side because being a lawyer is one thing. As I'm out there now, the last thing on people's list when they look at me, they're like, oh, yeah, she's a lawyer too. I'm the not. first thing, right. Well, and the first thing that people focus on is, oh my God, you spent 20 years in MLB, you must know everyone. Right. And they will see who I'm sitting with at tournaments, that I'm sitting with the scouting director of the Padres, or I'm sitting with the general manager in the Marlins, that speaks much more to people. So, yeah. you know, as, as they both said, you know, you need to start just going in saying, hey, I'm a lawyer, you know, I, I went to law school so that it would be some stamp of brilliance on my head, mm -hmm. not because um, really of any more profound reason than that, but um, to establish the relationships and whether that's scouts or whether that's club people or those are the things you've got to start with to kind of get a little bit of you know, legitimacy one, one, that is going to lure people. One last thing. One of the top agents in the 80s and the 90s was a guy by the name of Tommy Tanser. You know who he was? Mm -hmm. He was an elementary school teacher. He had Steve Finley, he had all these guys. He always used to say to me, hey, this is a great job because I'm still the babysitter. I wasn't school. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good job. And, and the, it's a good yeah. job. You better know the players, and then you better know everybody inside Major League ne Baseball. Next question. we got to stay on clock. Even though baseball doesn't have a clock, we do here. Clock. Look clock. I'm good. Replay. That did not change in the CD. Okay. <laughs> uh, Jim Stevens from Buckeye, Arizona. Uh, my question is, do either of you uh, see represent uh, a cricket player? A good question. I so would. Represent yeah. a cricket player. Cricket 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 player. I would try to convert that. That's what Ray Pointer and my buddy did when they did the million dollar yeah. arm. That's the, that's the two cricket yeah. players they took out of there. It, it could it could work, but you know it, it's a long process. It's like I don't have the time. It, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a long, it's a long, long process to develop those players. Right now, there, there's one. You know, there's some players like from South Africa. They're not they're not cricket players, but watching them come over and try to become major league baseball players, it's a long process. And yeah. your seven years might be up, but you use yeah. yeah, my buddy's yeah. uh, my buddy's but, formula. Yeah. But in fairness, whether it's Australian rugby football player, or, uh, Australian rules football, there's a cross pollination going Absolutely. on. Absolutely, yeah. no doubt. It's like yeah. we've never seen before. Great question, Jim. Next question. How you doing, Trey Rose from Richmond, Virginia? Um, first of all, Josh, sorry about uh, Kimley Jansen. Uh, I don't have very much money to buy you a glove. But I have a lot of ones laying at home if you would like it. I would, I would, yeah. very much so. Um, my question is, you know, looking at the international market, it's very diverse from different people from different areas to a 16-year-old to a guy who's in their 30s, which makes it really difficult to lay out rules very similar to a major league draft. Obviously, with this new cap, it's going to lead to people getting criminally unpaid, some people who deserve more money. What do you see as being the optimal system if you could change it to you know, put in something that is going to be fair to everybody? Free market. Free market. Yeah. Free, Free market is really the only way to do that. And having been on the clubs, like, like you said, you know, they're looking for rules. They like some semblance of controls. As much as the clubs will balk against, no, I don't want to be told with this, I don't want to pay a damn luxury tax, I don't want to, but there, there is a sense of comfort, I think, in some semblance of control. I mean, I was in a meeting where an agent, a, a general manager of a club that had just paid a not that great pitcher $105 million, and this is over 10 years ago, he yeah. said, we need help. Uh, we can't pay those damn six-year free agents that much, 20 grand a month. Mm -hmm. I'm like, really? Is that what we're bitching about in this room? Because I, 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 I don't, I you know. That. Yeah. And so there is that sense of comfort, but, uh, you know, from the club perspective. But from a player perspective, free market's the only thing. Is I mean, it? you think the Puerto Ricans and the Canadians who have to come in and deal with Chris Bryant and all this, they can't compete with those guys. And there are, that's already a limitation. 
and why, you know, what makes the Puerto Rican different from the Venezuelan, the Dominican, the Cuban? I, yeah, it's the, the whole thing is it comes, I'm an accountant by trade. The whole thing comes down to this. If I ran my business thinking that I got it, somebody's got to put controls on me, I'm in trouble. Hey, if I've got this budget, I know how I'm going to spend it. And if you're worth 20% of my budget, I got to make a hard decision to give it to you. And now you got to move on. Now, on the other hand, you got to be careful, like what the Tom Hicks did in Dallas when they gave A Rod all that money. And you're sitting there, your team's not all that good. What the hell are you spending all this money on one player? So, you know, so try to spread it out, but you got to learn, you got to have budgetary controls. On, That's what Major League Baseball is doing right now. On the other side of the coin, right? because baseball doesn't have a hard cap like we have in NFL and NHL, I, I've stood by this. Uh, the competition is the product, not the victory. And I think the sanity. And I understand from an agent perspective, don't get me wrong, but I love that my Kansas City Royals were very competitive. Uh, and I think that's something we didn't have for a long time, watching those damn Yankees as a little boy, uh, and Roger Maris and others. Uh, it just is. So there's another side yeah. to the business side, respect me. Next question, thank you. Yeah, that was just the agent side. It's <laughs> <laughs> an agent panel, that's time. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but we're trying to educate them. Yeah, I'm not a fan. I, I mean, I, I actually did want to say that. Like, I when I go to a game, and I, I there's no room for it, but, but, but I did want to interject this. I, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I love baseball. I love the game. I can go to any game and just watch it break down stuff instinctively. I'll go to a little league games that are breaking down stuff. But um, when I go to a major league game, it's not a fun experience in the sense that I'm cheering. I don't care who wins and loses as long as all my guys are healthy, happy, and get paid. So you really got to strip your fandom if you want to work in, in baseball very, very yeah. quickly. Yes. <laughs> Next question. Hi, my name's Justin Swicker. I'm from Glen Burnie, Maryland, about an hour away. Um, one thing that's always been stressed to me is clients. Like, how can you get a client? I know you guys described how you guys got your first clients. But my question is, once you get somebody on board with you, who do you talk to then? Who you do you sell that player to, and how do you get contact? You got to do a good job. Yeah. You got to yeah. do well, you gotta, And then you got to look at the circumstances. Yeah. Though, when where are you going to go get the player? Look, first thing you should do as an aspiring agent, start meeting people inside Major League Baseball. Get to know the farm directors. Get to know the scouting directors. Just call them up, meet them at the ballpark, say, hey, and, and just go forward. And then you start looking at players and you say, okay, I'm going to get this player. When, when I signed Armando Reynoso, because he sort of came to me, it was, a luck, it was a lucky break, but I knew the people in the Atlanta system. I had had a guy that, and then he introduced me to the John Sherholz, to the Frank Rents, to all the guys. And I was able to walk in and say, I represent Armando Reynoso. I said, okay, what do you want to do, Oscar? But you've got to know people. Players want to feel that you can have all the degrees in the world, but if you don't know the people inside Major League Baseball, you're going to fail as an agent. You better know those people. Oh, yeah. you better, when they hire new people, I go up to them and say, I'm Oscar Suarez. Some pe people may know me, some people may not know me. But I want to get my name out there because eventually I may have a player that I want to shoot their way. Yeah, so. Other comments from the panel? Yeah, especially, I mean, it's easy. Drafted players, you know, the players that are going to go real high in the draft, that are doing every yeah. perfect game showcase, that are doing area codes and all that, everybody sees him. You don't have to worry about that. that. Not that you don't have to worry about that guy, but that's not your. That's not where your value as an agent comes. When I had players recently, and I've, I've had people approach me, and, and I've only in this for five months, um, but I've had players approach me who said, okay, they've been released, they got a raw deal, they said there was a player that was subject to the draft, he went through five tryouts with the same team, the last one being three days before the draft at the team's spring training complex, and they didn't they didn't sign him. They didn't pick him. So we think that it was the agent who was representing him at the time asked for way too much money, overestimated his position in the draft, and did not look at the totality of the circumstances. Like where you know you can't just ask for okay, I'm being drafted in the 19th round. I want three million dollars. That doesn't exist. So I went to the general manager of the club that it was interested in him, and I am finding out what the hell happened. Yeah, they established signability. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's you got to know what you got to know what your player is worth. Oh That's yeah. Why. That's part of the evaluation if, process. If, if you poison, I don't do the draft anymore. I'm maybe the only certified agent who just completely skips the draft. The reason is for me, it's not cost effective. Um, I don't purposely camp out and steal guys, it's not what I do, but I do tend to gravitate towards lower round drafted guys. Yeah. So like Seth Lugo was a 34th rounder, I mean Michael Brantley was a 7th rounder, 
I mean, J Jefferson was a first rounder, but most of my guys, every player I've ever represented the big was fifth round or later, going to the 40th right. round. And I mean, that's been my niche. Right. But in the draft, very quickly, with the money, if you come in too high, like they said, it will poison the signability. And if you, my strategy when I do the draft, I do not mind talking about because I don't do it anymore. But if you just go to a team and you talk to them and you figure out through work <laughs> what the guy's worth is, if you just say your guy's signing for what he's worth without putting a number on it, he's going to get drafted. And that's a much better strategy than coming in high or going lower. It's just teams know that game, so it's better to skip it. And this is something you'll appreciate by having relationships with the people at the clubs right. that are going to be making those and, decisions. And, and in my world in football, I call it the Ralph rule. you got to get Ralph Dawkins out of Louisville as a free agent, and then you get introduced to his brother from Clemson <laughs> two years later. And you all know that. You get a lot of nice oh, referrals. Last two questions, we'll yeah. take a break. Yeah, my clients are all referrals. Yeah, <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is Mike Pena. I'm the general manager for the Hitler Baseball Academy in Newark, New Jersey. Um, I have this question is for all of you guys. I have a right-handed pitcher, six foot two, throws the ball around nine I'm in Jersey. An hour. Um, <laughs> I'm in Florida. He has a 60% uh, baseball scholarship to Marist. Um, he's also gotten several looks from the Baltimore Orioles, Seattle Mariners, and Texas Rangers. Um, he's in my organization, so I'm trying to guide him the best I possibly can. Um, he's projected 10th to 20th round. Um, my gut instinct is, unless it's life-changing money, where he can put some away from college to go to college. What's life-changing money to you? Life-changing money him. is... Like, what is that? You have to establish that. Yeah, you gotta say, right. it depends on the kind of family circumstances. Yeah, <laughs> some people, 50 grand is life-changing money. You can't just say six figures. For him, for him, it's, it's well over six figures. It's, yeah, he's, he's going a, to college. He's going yeah. to college, yeah, he's and 10th to 20th rounder, He's going to college. Going to college. college. Good, good question, though. Good, good Unless question. you have dirty pictures of the GM. <laughs> 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 and it depends which GM. But I actually yeah. have one thing. I had an 11th rounder last year, and this is, this is everyone's going to get mad at me for this year. But I had an 11th rounder last year, uh, this past June. I signed him after the draft because I literally ran into him at a GameStop. I swear to God that happened. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. That really happened. And he signed for $1.1 million in the 11th round him without an agent. So... Yeah. The draft is crafted in a way you don't really need us for the draft in some circumstances. Right. If the team just went, Bryce Harper, for instance, he could have done that by himself. Right. He didn't yeah. want to, but he could have. Yeah. The, the way we, we help, actually, is a guy like your kid, if hypothetically he's a guy that's worth X amount of dollars, if we can realize that and actually get him what he thinks he's worth and try to do that and exhaust those options to see if we can actually get him like that, what? We're supposed to be doing Good stuff. Just be One careful with the college. Uh, be oh, careful yeah. with the college he's going to. Make yeah. sure the coach understands pitching because that, that's yes. that's you don't want to get burned out in three years. Yeah, that's big. Let the other thing is too, I just want is if to be able to to have an advisor who can help boost his draft status too. Yeah. Obviously, it's the kid's talent, but if you can get more eyes on him, maybe you know he's at a school that not necessarily people a lot of people are going to go see. If you can get more eyes on him while he's in high school.